Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. Welcome to the Connecting with Coincidence radio show with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, bringing together the world's synchronicity experts to help you use meaningful coincidences to develop spiritually, psychologically, and practically. For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence into your web browser to find the book, website, Psychology Today blog, YouTube channel, and Facebook page. And now, here is the host of the Connecting with Coincidence radio show, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. Yes, 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 yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, and this is CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence. Talking about serendipity today and start off with Horace Walpole, a member of the British House of Commons in the 18th century, who recognized in himself a talent for finding what he needed just when he needed it. He based the name Serendipity on a fairy tale called The Travels and Adventures of the Three Princes of Serendip, which is an ancient name for the island of Sri Lanka off India's southern coast. The king of the fable recognized that education requires more than learning from books, so he sent his sons out of the country to broaden their experience. Throughout the story, the clever princes carefully observe their surroundings, and then use their observations in ways that save them from danger and death. For Walpole, serendipity meant finding, by chance, something valuable using informed observation, which he calls sagacity. They are happy accidents, and the four ingredients of serendipity include active searching out of the need of something and curiosity, chance, informed observation, and valued outcome. Serendipity can take several forms. One is looking for something and finding it in an unexpected way. Another is looking for something and finding something else. A third is observing something in one situation and recognizing how that something can fill a need in another situation. An example of that was Swiss electrical engineer George Mestral in 1941 wondered why burdock seeds clung to his coat and his dog's coat. And so he invented Velcro. And a fourth is looking for something but not sure what and then recognizing it, which I did wandering around in a library one day and think many other people have done that as well. Serendipity. Well, our guest today is a serendipity researcher, Wendy Ross. 
Wendy is a cognitive science and a rug scientist and a rugby player. Mm-hmm. Based right, Wendy. There's not, based, there's not there's not many of us out there. <laughs> nope. Based at Kingston University in London. Her main area of research is the role of serendipity in creativity and problem solving from both an experimental and a philosophical perspective. Her recent publications have explored mathematical and insight problem solving, collaborative creativity and serendipity. She is also a section editor for the Encyclopedia of the Possible, and where I met her, secretary of the Serendipity Society, we met at the first international meeting of the Serendipity Society in London a few months ago. Wendy, welcome to the show. Um, Hi, Bernie. It's nice to speak to you again. It's great to have you on the show, and nice to speak to you, too. Um, Well... We're going to talk about serendipity, synchronicity, and coincidences. And as you as you know, I, I include serendipity under meaningful coincidences along with synchronicity. Uh, but th- that's a discussion I, that I think we're going to have today, um, that you have trouble with the concept of coincidence, uh, and you have trouble finding coincidences in your life. What's the difference in your mind between a coincidence and serendipity? Um, I think for me, and I did struggle because um, I was looking for coincidences before I came on the show, and I spent quite a lot of time. In fact, I almost thought I might steal somebody else's um, coincidences and present them as my own because I couldn't find any at all in my own life. Um, And I think for me, the difference between coincidence and serendipity would be that coincidence has a um, an element of um, the noticing's there, but the acting on it isn't necessarily. Um, So two things just happen to happen at the same time. Whereas for me, serendipity is something where the person is active in making the um, making it happen. Ah, agency is a yeah. key part of it, of serendipity. Uh, that's a that's an interesting discussion because I, I'm pretty sure that uh, agency is a big part of a lot of uh, meaningful coincidences, but it's not as evident as it might be as it is with serendipity. So that's a that's a, an obvious distinction which I never really co- thought about too much. But sagacity is what part of what you mean by agency, the ability to recognize uh, a, a something uh, as coming together in a, in a useful way. Exactly. And if you look at some of, some of the research I do, traces are artists when they are in a creative process, when they're creating something. So I do longitudinal research with artists and we use eye tracking technology as well to follow what they're doing, to follow what they're looking at. And um, what we notice is that there's two aspects that needs to happen there. That often accidental things happen within a creative process. I particularly work with a sculptor. And within that process, there'll be times when something gets knocked or when something happens. What's really important, what makes it then become serendipitous is that he notices that particular accident, that particular change that's happened to the sculptural piece. And he uses it and incorporates it into the rest of the um, the rest of the piece that he's making. Uh, a coincidence or a meaningful coincidence doesn't exist until somebody notices it. Yeah. Maybe I'm just terrible at noticing meaningful coincidences. <laughs> well, no, it's okay because I think you're emphasizing the more conscious agency. Um, but the, it, it, I, we we say some, sometimes we say the, the thing of a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it. Does it make a sound? And we, we have the same kind of question with uh, with co- meaningful coincidences. Do they happen? Uh, if it, do they exist if nobody notices them? And and we require we require that somebody notices them uh, in order for them to exist because they have to be reported. So it, it's the noticing um, that seems to be common, but there's something different about the agencies in the serendipities that, because the artist in what you're talking about is looking for something. The artist mm-hmm. is, is prepared for something odd to happen that he or she might use. Was that correct? Exactly, yes. And and there's some artists that will discuss that actually for them what counts as their artistic talent would be the ability to interact with accidents, although they artists that think like that don't like to think about accidents. And I, I imagine that's something else. We've discussed as well accidents before, so I imagine that's something else that will come up today. 
But that, that ability to interact with accidents and to take advantage of accidents and use them is a key part for them of their artistic talent. That is an interesting definition of artistry, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it is, and it's one it's one that only exists as a definition if you're engaged in the sort of artistry that involves making something. So within that craft art border, it involves actually making something rather than a conceptual art where it's, where where it can't have quite have that same power. So you're you're ref- keeping this to artistic activities. What about that burdock seed? Um, uh, example I gave where he wasn't looking for mm-hmm. uh, he wasn't looking for something creative it wasn't an artistic thing but he noticed something that then he could use yeah absolutely and what's really interesting is um when you come so I came to serendipity later I started off in creativity research and then came to serendipity research off the back of the creativity research and um, mainly because examples like the burdock seed examples like um the the work that's done with post-it notes and the invention of post-it notes, those those examples cross over the fields of creativity and cross over the fields of serendipity. That something happens that's beyond our control. So the burdock sees it's not something that's within our control. But then we have an agentic control. We, we impose some control on that, and from that arises serendipity. And interestingly, some of that narrative seems to be happening in creativity research as well, that creativity involves taking advantage of something that, that you haven't planned and then using it as something that you have. Coincidences can work that way also. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a psychological version of, uh, of coincidence use, if somebody has a conflict and is having trouble resolving it and somehow then finds something in the environment that matches and comments upon the conflict that's in their minds and then can find a resolution of that conflict through observing what happened in the environment. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I, I, I think we've, we've, we're in a broad agreement that we're looking at a similar sort of a similar engagement with your environment that's important for coincidences and serendipity, I think, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and I, I enjoy trying to see the similarities and the differences. Uh, I, I sent you a, a, a draft for a post that, um, that Samantha is going to put on, the, on mm-hmm. the Serendipity Society website where I'm trying to compare and contrast because there are some differences between serendipity and synchronicity. And, and part of it depends on the context. When you put it in the terms of artists, uh, who are actually looking for uh, serendipitous events. And I have an artist friend who is describing what you're talking about, and you're making it yet clearer that he loves to see what happens and then sees uh, the accidents and incorporate them into his painting. And that's, yeah. what, that's what you're talking about. Um, well, we're we're coming to we're coming to the end of of this segment because you mentioned that in the paper that you sent me, and also um, how to to disentangle the subjective sense of serendipity from its actual occurrence. I think those are really great questions, and we'll get to that in our next segment. You're listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, uh, MD, on the Exxon Broadcast Network. We're talking with Wendy Ross. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by shaman worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, 
international long-distance shamanic healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Shamanic healing is the key to personal empowerment. Why? All four levels of our being, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, must be addressed for us to enjoy balanced, healthy, abundant lives. Yet there are few provisions for spiritual or energetic healing. Shamanism, found at the root of all cultures, is a very effective spiritual healing modality. To find quality shamanic healing you can trust, regardless of where you live, look no further than find your Path Home Long Distance Shamanic Healing Program. All Path Home Long Distance Healing Practitioners have been trained and certified through Path Home Shamanic Art School. Change your life. Live abundantly. Schedule a long distance shamanic healing session with Gwilda Wiecka or one of her quality practitioners today at findyourpathhome.com. You are, you're listening to Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Buckman, MD, on the Exxon Broadcast Network. We're talking to Wendy Ross, ex-rugby player, now serendipity researcher, particularly into micro-serendipity. But before we get into some of the key research ideas that Wendy is taking apart, you, you told me about a, a coincidence uh, uh, involving flame pots and a friend of yours. Could you tell us about that one, please? Um, yes. So there's these flame pots. They're two, three thousand years old. Um, they're from the Japanese culture. And I have a friend that's particularly interested in flame pots. He's also particularly interested in the use of eye tracking technology to understand what's happening when people look at pots to understand to what extent the pots direct the person's gaze and to what extent the gaze comes from the person themselves. And we were sat there and he was discussing this. Now, it so happens that I have a, an on permanent loan for my department, a pair of eye tracking glasses. But what he really needed was somebody that had connections with um, with a city called Norwich. And little did he know that Norwich is actually where I grew up and where um, and where, the, where all of my family were based. And beyond that, the place of the pot where he wanted to get people to have a look at with the eye tracking glasses happened to be right next to my father's office. So there's there's one person um, in the world that seems to have these particular skills of being having a pot of coming from Norwich, having these eye tracking glasses, and he just happened to be sitting right next to her. So I suppose maybe it's a meaningful coincidence for him rather than a meaningful coincidence for me. But um, it certainly has now led to a, a, an ongoing research project looking at how people look at pots simply because of where where I happen to be born. Exactly. It was a it was a serendipity for him. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. uh, why wouldn't that be also called a serendipity for him? Yes, and I and I suppose and I suppose it was a serendipity for him, and also who knows how much he engineered the conversation as well. I've often wondered how much how much he engineered this. That I wonder if there was somebody out there um, who might have all these skills that happened to be sitting opposite me. But yeah. And he was he was looking, which is a key part of anything an artistic thing. He needed something, but in order in order to have that need met, you got to like ask sometimes. So he opened his mouth, and that's you got to do something. It's one thing to be in a situation. I don't know how many 
good serendipities or coincidences don't happen because somebody doesn't say something. Oh, I think, I, and I, I think, um, I think that happens an, an awful lot. Actually, you see things, but you're scared to make that last step. And it's like you were saying earlier, coincidences only happen really when you recognize them as being coincidences. And, and I think when you act on them, don't they? Otherwise, otherwise, they just become a missed coincidence or a missed opportunity. Yes. Uh, I, I, I like to say the dog that trots about finds the bone. Absolutely. Absolutely. The more... Um, the, the more you can put yourself in a situation where you encounter things, so the sort of the work of the of Sander Erdeles and the super encounterers, or Leonard Bjornborn, who writes about the different sort of environments that might precipitate serendipity, it's all about putting yourself in that situation, isn't it, where you can have these, where there's much more chance for things to happen. And both of them were on my show with delightful conversations. You've got to be doing something. Now, one of the <laughs> one of the things you just told us about this eye tracking, you said it rather quickly. I want to emphasize it: the, that how much does the pot direct the eyes, and how much does the person direct the eyes? Yes. Now, that, this is one of the themes that became loud to me at our conference in London is how much the environment influences how serendipity takes place. And you used a term environmental agency. Would you is, I think this is what you, would you explain that to us, please? OK, so environmental agency is my way of um, expressing. So. My understanding of agency, and I don't have a, have a philosopher's background, my, my understanding of agency is there normally has to be an intentionality behind it. Um, but there's been a movement, certainly there's a movement called material engagement theory, which is by a, um, an archaeologist based in Oxford called Lambros Malaforas, which looks at how materials can actually have a level of agency and that they can direct people's actions without the intentionality. And from that, that's really where this idea of environmental agency comes from. So within cognitive science, there's the idea that our mind can be extended, our mind can be embedded, and our mind can be situated within a certain environment. And that environment can direct our thoughts. And what I'm really interested in is when we talk about this, and cognitive scientists within this tradition will talk about the environment directing our thoughts or directing our problem solving. For me, it's, it's how does that happen? Is it just a matter of environmental affordances? Or can we see moments when accidents arise, when unplanned things arise, when random chance arise? which then enters into our cognitive processes and so for me environmental agency is a way of characterizing this idea that things can happen beyond any human agency they're just accidents and then they get taken up by human agents and incorporated into their cognitive processes well if if the environment can be an agent then it's not so much an accident well, it's how we would define it's, it's accident within our definition. I, I think. see. Yeah, within the human our, definition of accident, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, now it, it, when the environment becomes an agent, we begin to imbue the environment with a, an intention. I don't know. You see, I don't, I don't know whether we do. And, and, and I'm willing to be picked up on this by, by, by people that are far better read than me on this. Um, that I think has always been a coupling between agency and intentionality um, for a long time. But I, I don't think that coupling is necessary. I think agency is just having an effect on something, but you don't necessarily need to intend to have that effect. You don't, so, so by talking about environmental agency, it's not consciousness and nor is it a sense of agency. So the environment doesn't have to know anything. It's not an animalistic um, sense. It's more just that the environment will intervene within, certainly within the stuff I look at, within problem solving, within creativity. The environment will intervene in a way which is not under the control of any human agents. So therefore, it's environmental agency. Well, this is a funny philosophical argument because there's a lot of people who think there are agents outside of human agents influencing our behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is a step in that direction. It's, it's still pretty neutral, uh, but there's still something about environmental agency without intention, which is somewhat of a contradiction. And, I, 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 and I, one of my favorite phrases uh, was uh, the the Com the demand the characteristics of the situation mm -hmm. how that's a social sociolo sociological idea that our behavior 
is is influenced by what are often social but also environmental the way the architecture of the building or the room that we're in the kind of music that might be playing the the confirmation of the people around begin to make a demand on my behavior that mm-hmm. is that you would call a, a, a intention not intent but agent you might call it agency there's no conscious mind behind it thinking about it but then others can say well maybe there is and so i'll leave the question right there but you're getting into a very very interesting question about environmental agency and intention um and, and it, it just fascinated me now you mentioned also something about the mind being embedded in the environment embedded and a couple of other things that you that i can't remember embedded in what else so the, the the traditional sort of theoretical position would be called the 4e cognition and so that within this cogni- within this theoretical position cognition is embedded it's enacted it's embodied and it's extended so it's the idea that actually what we consider to be our our mind is not just our brain so that looking at just the brain and just isolating the brain doesn't really tell us that much about higher cognitive functions such as thinking such as problem solving and even other cognitive cognitive functions that aren't necessarily studied so much in a cognitive psychologist lab such as loving such as knowing such as understanding but some of these higher functions that make us human some of the arguments are now that these things don't exist if we don't consider the body and the situation in which a person's in. So please go down these four E's because they're new to me and new enough to me. And I think our, our listeners also, what does a mind being embedded in the environment mean? It's exactly, it's exactly what you were saying about when you're in a situation and um, the, by the mind being embedded, it really, it's more often a situated mind. But I think they chose embedded because it's an E, right? So otherwise, <laughs> three E's and an S, it doesn't work quite so well. So when you read about it on its own, it's always situated. When you read about it with the rest of them, it's always embedded. But I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think we all know why that is. Um, so it's the idea that, as exactly as you said, our decisions, our, our thought processes are influenced by the situation in which we find ourselves. And so isolating ourselves from that situation isn't ever going to be a true reflection of thinking processes that happens in the wild, to borrow um, Hutchins' phrase. And he wrote an entire book actually called Cognition in the Wild, um, which started quite a lot of this about how we actually think beyond a psychologist's lab. And so for that, you then have, then you move into embodied cognition. And embodied cognition is the idea that our body is very important um, in thinking and also in some of the metaphors and ways that we use our body and the ways we understand the world. Um, Enacted cognition is that by doing, we think by doing, so that we manipulate the world around us and we move the things around us and thinking happens as we do things. And for extended cognition, extended cognition is the idea that the, the... those things that we have all around us, like a mobile phone or a pen or a piece of paper, they are functional member parts of our cognitive system so that our memory becomes extended. So we have a mobile phone with us and we know that we've got a, an appointment to speak with Bernie at um, three o'clock our time. Um, that, and, and we don't have to remember it anymore. Instead, we set the alarm on our phone. The phone rings and tells us where we need to be. And so part of our of the memory system is functionally equivalent. It's now outside and extended outside of the brain boundary. Yes, that that's the, that's of all these things, that's the easiest one for me to pay attention to. We've come to the end of this segment. You're listening to Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Our guest is Wendy Ross. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, 
haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com, or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. Welcome back to CC with BB. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, and we are talking with ex-rugby player Wendy Ross, who is a cognitive scientist who uses eye tracking to study serendipity. Amazing stuff. And one of the questions that I, I had for her as we talked about the four E's, as you, our listeners, and I'm learning this too, about how our minds are not just in our skulls and that they are maybe that we can talk about a greater consciousness, but in between is the environment in which our minds exist. Our minds are embedded or situated in our environments. They are they are enacted, meaning that we we think by action. So when we move, it helps us think that we are embodied because we move through our environment. And it's easy to think about they are extended because we use our mobile phones and our memories expanded through pieces of paper and other places we remember things. Wendy, what does enacted mean? What I'm sorry, what does um, em- embedded mean again when you say situated our minds are situated in our environments well you you spoke when you gave your example before without even knowing Ben. you say you spoke about it when you talked about people in a room okay, okay. So if, if we if we imagine somebody in a room somebody is we are always within a situation and that situation changes the way that we think and some of our, some of our thought processes. So that when so, when something is situated, when our minds are embedded, the the underlying argument is if we are studying what's happening in the mind, we have to study it as part of a system, and we have to study it as a situated system because it will change depending on the situation. So our thought processes will change depending on the situation. So to create a model of thinking. Which, which excludes the situation, would not be a very satisfactory model when we actually think about how we really think. I got that now. I got that now. Um, the, one of the other po- key points I got from your paper on micro serendipity was that the subjective sense of serendipity should be disentangled from its actual occurrence. And that's what you are studying because uh, you want to catch the micro serendipities before anybody says there's some kind of value to it, some kind of desirable outcome. You want to get it before somebody puts that subjective read on it. You want to say, no, this is just what's happened where we can say environment and observation came together. 
Yes. So so I'm a really a big contradiction because I've just told you that we should never study people outside of a system and uh, and that all models need to take into account all levels of complexity. Um, but then at heart, I'm a cognitive scientist, so I like to make everything small and controlled and take everything out of the system. So I'm I, I'm I'm happy with that contradiction, but I can I can see that it's it's definitely there. Um, so what I would like to look at and but with I think with the knowledge that it's only a part of what makes something serendipity it's only a part of what yeah, some, yeah, makes something yeah. happen rather than saying that this is what it is because I think you're absolutely right the um, subjective observation of either, whether it's coincidences whether it's serendipity whether it's those things they are really important our understanding really of how we move through the world is subjective and it is our own personal narrative but I'm also quite convinced that we can find those moments when people spot something that happens in the environment and they take advantage of that. The way I deal with whether or not it's a positive outcome is I use problem solving tasks where they're, they're really, you can tell they solve the problem or they don't solve the problem. So I categorize solving the problem as being positive. So I don't need them to tell me whether or not it's positive because the, the posit it's, it's there within the um, within the task itself. It's built in like that. Well, this this subjective versus versus objective is very important. And I'm glad you're doing this because I've been wondering about how to be able to do that myself because I have situations where I notice somebody else having a coincidence. It's almost like the friend you were talking about with the flame pots. He mm -hmm. may not have called it a serendipity, but you could notice that it was his serendipity and that you were part of it. And that kind of objective observation is important. But then there's another level of this. You may, may remember Jermaine Stockbridge at our meeting um, who, who wrote about um, how it's not even the, the description of the actual event that's so important. It's how the person tells the story. Exactly. The, 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 and her paper, you sent me her paper as well. And, and it, yeah, exactly what you're saying. How does how so would you summarize what you got out of that paper for our listeners and then tell me how that affects your ways of thinking? Well, I think for me, it's this the, the, the narrative and the way that we think about um, serendipity and coincidences. They are they are really important. Um, but I I'm. I'm still just interested in in that in that moment that's outside yeah. of the narrative. But yeah. I don't think that they're not. I don't think they're not important aspects to, to look at um, and I think I think it's all right if we have something incredibly complex like serendipity or like coincidence to say we can't look at the whole thing in one go so we can understand that for some people it's the way that it's narrated and that particular type that particular strand of research is important as well as understanding that can also be looked at from an objective point of view. It's a little bit like the problems of consciousness, you know, the problems of consciousness that there's there's two ways of looking at consciousness, whether we observe it from a third person point of view, or from a first person point of view. And really you can't understand these 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 really big complex things unless you start to break them down into, into all the different points of view. Very good, very good. The 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 I the first person versus the third person is narrative a first person or a third person because the narrative is about the it's about the thing itself. Yeah, um, <laughs> and, it's, and 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 even though I say that I have an um an an objective spotting of serendipity that I can I can look at the moments of serendipity objectively. Clearly, there's a subjectivity in it because I'm the one that spots it, right? Right. So actually, the noticing has to happen twice within my within my studies. It happens when the participant notices the accident or or the problem or the the change in the environment that generates a solution. But then it also happens when I notice the participant noticing. So there's a double there, there's a double level of noticing that goes on. So it's not I would never claim it's entirely clear cut. Um, I think there always is a level. And I think there's a danger with um, quantitative scientists and quantitative psychologists of thinking because they're dealing with numbers, they're dealing with something which is much more objective. And I talked a lot with Jermaine about this because she's a, she's a qualitative researcher and they're much more able to embrace their subjectivity. Whereas the quantitative researchers that I work with will say, well, there's a number there. So it, you know, there must be some level of objectivity. But you still have that that personal narration, that personal understanding, even if you think you're putting yourself in a more objective point of view. Good. 
Good. You can never get away from the subjective because I'm right. looking at it. I'm looking at it. You can't be you can't be objective. But I I, I get a I, I really like being meta. Uh, I like being going this level and then looking at this that level from the second level and the third mm-hmm. level and the fourth mm-hmm. level. Uh, I think it's part of what we have to develop as human beings: the capacity to shift between observation, then observing our observation, and then observing our observation of the observation. Yeah, no, I think I, th- I think you're right. Um, but I think what 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 I what the thing that's coming out of the research that I'm doing, which is the observing people and putting them in situations where they are more likely to encounter serendipity because they have these very materially rich environments where yeah. things can cross over. Um, I don't work so much with the groups of people because if it just becomes too complex, but there's no reason why you couldn't have rich in, with people. I just happen to have it rich with material objects. Um, what is then noticed, which is really interesting, is the moment when people don't notice um, the environment yeah. yielding something. Yeah. Um, but then now you're in a situation where that's something that I've noticed. But how many things have I not noticed that that person hasn't noticed, right? right. So I notice something and I go, oh, this person didn't notice that. Look, I'll, I'll tick that on my coding scheme as, as, missed seren- as missed serendipity. But then there may be things that I haven't noticed. And in fact, a reviewer said exactly that recently. Well, what about the things that you haven't noticed? Or about the thing, you know, how, how far do we go backwards? to find those moments of missed serendipity or missed opportunities who 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 owns those if you like yeah that and and that's the kind of thinking that can make people very weird because it makes <laughs> you a little crazy to have to keep doing that but there's some of us and I don't know how many there are who who find that a, a very good mental exercise to wonder about wondering about almost it's like wondering yeah. what what did i miss what did, you and you you can you can get spun out and you have to get to a place in the practical world where you're saying this is what i saw this is what the other person saw now we've got another minute in this segment but the you you're dealing with artists and i assume it's kind of it's painters or or, or so sculptors. I, mainly, I mainly work with one sculptor yeah with, with one sculptor you with yeah, one so, so you watch this one sculptor you watch how his eyes track what he's doing mm-hmm and you see how how he takes what he notices that might be uh, useful, or we'll call it a serendip- micro-serendipity, and incorporates that in his sculpturing. Exactly. And then, I, then, then I'm looking as well, I, I would like to look at, at this, mo- this notion of accidents um, far more, and I, that, that's part of where I want to develop my research in the yeah, next, well, next phase. Well, we're we've, we're coming to the end of this segment, and the idea of accidents very very important, because sometimes it's just called random, and sometimes it it's something else. It's a there are other factors going on, and we're talking about environment having something to do with it. You're coming to we're li- we're you're listening to connecting with coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Biteman, M.D. on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Our guest is Wendy Ross, ser- micro serendipity researcher. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. 
They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Memorable dynamic presentations are a not-so-secret weapon in the business world. Do you have a powerful message that must be shared, but you haven't found a way to deliver that message? Do you want to be known as a top public speaker who gets amazing results? Are you ready to create and deliver your powerful message? Thomas Hides can help you create and deliver your speech to get the results you desire. Visit IconQuality.com. Did you expect your business to flourish, but instead it plateaued or didn't get off the ground yet? Would you like to achieve massive goals and discover new sources of income within your business? When you're ready to experience that type of success with fast results, Cindy Hendricks is the business coach for you. Her work with entrepreneurs and business owners has been life-changing. To get you and your business where you want to be, go to imaginemoresuccess.com. Has the fear of public speaking stalled your business or personal life? What would you give to develop and maintain supreme confidence? Have an invaluable private program to always perform at your best. Imagine how you would feel. You can have all that and so much more today with Thomas Hyde's life-changing course called Number One Fear Unleashed. Visit NumberOneFear.com and be liberated from your fear of public speaking. Yes, welcome back to CC with BB. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. We're talking with Wendy Ross about micro serendipity, and and I want to be able to to expand some of what we're talking about because in our, our in our conference, it became clearer that it wasn't enough to talk about one smart guy, um, who can, usually a guy that came up with something, um, but it, it we had. A- it was written out of history. That was the problem, Bernie, wasn't it? Like Moldy Mary. Yeah, like Moldy lots, Mary, yeah. yeah. Lots of smart girls, yeah. <laughs> lots of smart girls who didn't get the attention, but you're helping that to stop happening and get to the women who are doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that Moldy Mary is a great example of that. I, Moldy Mary is, is, is the end part for our listeners. And the end part, will you talk, tell us what Moldy, who Moldy Mary was. And so Mold, Moldy Mary is, is, is the end part of the penicillin story, really. And do you know what? It's awful. It's, her actual real name has even just dropped out of my head right now, even though I spend quite a lot of time telling people we should know her real name. That's terrible. 
I know it's terrible, isn't it? She was she was the person who found the um, the, the best way to mass produce penicillin um, via a particular sort of melon in a particular sort of market. And so, whereas all the men in the story have been were given Nobel prizes, were, um, were you know we all know them. We only know her as Met Moldy Mary because she found the right penicillin to cultivate mold. Yeah, and what I liked about that, she, she found it in a marketplace in Peoria, Illinois, where she worked. While every, mm-hmm. well, well, the U.S. had sent all its soldiers around the world looking for yeah. a melon that might work, but there it was right under her, their noses in Peoria, mm-hmm. Illinois. Uh, it's, a, it's a great story, and it doesn't get told often enough. But as, aside, aside from that, we're talking about – more and more you're bringing in and in the conference we talked about more and more how the environment has so much to do with it it's not just one person or another it's not just uh, alexander fleming working alone in the laboratory finding things there was a whole history and a whole current environment that helped him happen the have him ha- helped him find penicillin and, and you and, and this idea of environmental agency is became clearer and clearer as a key new idea to me anyway in the conference that we we've got to include the environment and one of the things that began to come out more is that we can train people to find environments and create environments that increase serendipity could you could you talk about that how training people in in being able to increase the likelihood of serendipitous events um i think so i i think that's i think that's tricky actually and it's it's one of the things if people approach me about the applied nature of any of my research you know now we all have to have applied natures for our research people will say <laughs> to me well, well surely um you can't just add to the sum of human knowledge just because it has to have a reason right um, <laughs> and people will say to me well what what's that surely now you can make people more serendipitous if we start to look at the missed serendipities or the times when they don't see it then there's a chance for us to train them to see it um I feel there's a real tug in human nature to impose order on randomness and to impose order on chaos um, and to think that we have it all under control. And what what to me comes out with you really engage with the environment is that you have to some extent lose that control. And you have to be able to say, actually, I can't just walk through with a plan in my mind and this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen. I have to instead be open to what's going on around me and able and flexible to respond to that randomness. And that's quite uncomfortable for an awful lot of people who like to impose control on their lives. Um, And so I think maybe that being comfortable with randomness might actually be the best way that we can then allow ourselves to take advantage of it. But also always conscious that it's not that in order that you if we have a narrative and we can impose ourselves on it and we're still falling back into this trap of thinking that we have full control. I'm going to change the word randomness to ambiguity and uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Because randomness implies something statistical and we've, yes, come to, right. we've, we've come to mean too many things by it. And one of the things I have observed with, uh, with coincidences, there are three different, three related, but different, qualities uh, that seem to increase the likelihood of a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them is major life changes. Uh, That when a person goes through uh, death of a a spouse is a big one, Uh, major illnesses, sicknesses, or even do some traveling. Um, When you make life changes, that increases the likelihood of person seeing coincidences and it's a way of of saying it increases randomness or uncertainty because when you get out of your usual environment uh, things aren't quite as predictable Uh, another variable is uh, is need that when somebody is needing something in a life transition these coincidences are more likely to happen and finally when there's a significant amount of emotion which i think drives the seeking those three qualities high emotion need and um life change increase the likelihood of coincidences and what i try to sell, tell people is that under those conditions just keep looking because you're more likely to see them yes and i think it's i think it's the keep looking and the being if you accept that 
for example, if you accept that cognition, or which is the main thing that I look at, if you accept that cognition and creativity don't just come from inside you. Yeah. Instead, 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 they are generated by your relationship with the world, and they're generated by your interaction with that world and, and the system around you. Then actually, although it can be quite scary for people, it's also incredibly liberating because you can start to say that you can you can find the things that you might need out there in the world if you keep looking and you keep being open to them. So exactly as you're saying with the with the coincidences, the same thing. Once you once you become aware of them and open yourselves up to those environmental um, pressures and those environmental um, nudges and things that come from it, and you allow yourself to be part of that, then you increase your chances of serendipity, and you increase your chances of coincidences, and you increase your chances of being engaged within that environment. Yes, you do. Now, in the last time, the last moments we have about four minutes or so. Um, one of the most interesting descriptions uh, of uh, serendipity people are, are the super encounterers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and when I go to like uh, the synchronicity things that I deal with, I think super encounterers might be relying at least sometimes on psi abilities, on, on, on telepathic, clairvoyant, uh, perhaps even psychokinetic capacities to make their serendipities happen. But that's my opinion. Could you talk about what you know about super encounterers, please? Well, do you know what? It's, it's interesting that you say that. Um... I just have in my head because I delivered a lecture this morning on on empathy and learning, so it's so it's there in my head. What a what a coincidence! Hey, you found a coincidence finally, Bernie. <laughs> um, and um, and in order to be a super encounterer, you have to enjoy other people's company, right? Because you can't force to be a super encounterer. You can't you can't turn around and say I'm going to go and meet this many people. And it's going to go right instead it's a natural state that people have and that they enjoy people's company and in order to enjoy people's company and to have that interaction i think you do have to have quite a high level of empathy now whether that empathy is couched in the terms of the way that you described it, or whether we understand it in different sort of more personality trait ways you you will naturally find more people if you naturally enjoy spending time with people and that normally happens when you have a high level of empathy which involves a high level of attunement to other people's feelings and other people's emotions. So yes, I, I think I think the two things are are connected. How, how I, I tell explain more to me about how empathy and super encounters are, are related. I think if you're a super encounterer, you um, you like to spend time with people. Yeah, and people like to spend time with you, and that's why it's hard to make the a decision to be a super encounterer um, cynically. Yeah. Um, so, but in order to like to spend time with people and for people to like to spend time with you, you normally have to have quite high levels of empathy because that makes those, all those conversations flow more and it makes everything easier, but you're much more attuned with the people that are around you so that you're able to pick up on their unconscious signals and their signs and therefore your conversations flow much more easily. And how does that lead to more serendipity? Because I suppose because you're more aware of the things that they're giving you. Again, you're more engaged in your environment. It's just that your environment in this case isn't a material thing. Um, your environment is other people. So you're much more open and much more responsive to them because you're much more able to read them. People aren't the only source of serendipitous events. Uh, there can be... Uh other environments in which serendipities mm. take place that are not directly involved with people. You can go to an art museum, you go to a library, uh, you can be walking around town and stuff happens. So what about those? Well, I think, I mean, and those are the things that the bulk of my research is. The bulk of my research is how people generate serendipity with things. Um, I like things more than people, maybe. No, not more than people. I'm not going to put that on it. But I like things, right? And um, so, so, so the bulk of my research is with things. But I think anything that's environmental, whether it's whether it's an animate thing or an inanimate thing, can evoke those things of serendipity if you allow yourself to connect with them. Yeah, if you allow yourself to connect with them, and the things you, the things you connect with are like artistic things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or just any material objects, materiality, 
any material objects are the things that are the things that I look at how people connect to, but there's no reason why that same connection couldn't also be extrapolated to people. No, it's the same well, idea. The dog that trots about finds the bone. You got to keep moving and you know, got to keep interacting with the environment. Yeah, and I, and we, we, are, we have a little bit of time left, and I got to believe that I've had a bunch of serendipity events happening <laughs> on the rugby field and when I played football. Uh, there's just kind of things happen, and you take advantage of it. Yeah. <laughs> An opening comes in there, and it's got to happen. Wendy, this has been a delightful conversation. Uh, I really appreciate your your coming on the show and, and educating me and educating some of our, our audience about serendipity and we can get to some coincidence. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. I've had a great time. Thank you, Bernie. You're very, you're very welcome. You've been listening to Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD on the Exxon Broadcast Network, and we've been talking with Wendy Ross. Mm-hmm.